Hi, my name is Imani Courtney, and here at School Based Alliance, we would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar to learn about new provider checklists in adolescents' pre visit self assessment questionnaires that encourage open, honest discussions around difficult subjects and increase adolescents' knowledge of HPV during well child visits. We believe in the transformation, power of health and education intersection. Here at School Based Alliance, we believe that all children and adolescents deserve to thrive. We connect our sector to a national community of peers. We support our field with common standards, measures, data, and research to effectively demonstrate their value. We advocate at a federal, state, and level, I'm sorry, local levels for the concept of health and education partnerships. We provide the field with high quality resources, training, and motivation, and the inspiration to excel in their work. When health and education come together, great things happen. Now, before we begin, we have a few housekeeping reminders. All attendees are in listen mode only. However, we want to hear your questions. To ask a question at any point during the webinar, please use the Q&A tool located in your Zoom control bar. We will address questions following the presentation. At the end of this webinar, attendees will be asked to complete an evaluation pool questions. Please let us know how we're doing. Your feedback is vital in helping us craft presentations that meet your needs. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website in one to two business days. Please also visit School Based Alliance for additional archives webinars for topics such as the ones you are viewing on the screen. Today's presenters. First, we have Jordina Snyder who has been working with the School-Based Alliance for three and a half years as a program manager. She currently oversees the Enhancing Adolescents' Well Care Visit initiative you will hear about today. Next, we have Lisa Howe, MP, who is a clinical site manager at the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center in Adel over MA. She will share her experience participating in the Enhancing Adolescents' Well Care Visit Initiative. And lastly, we have Nicole Ray, who is a physician assistant for the Blue Ride Health System in North Carolina. She will share her experience participating in the Enhancing Adolescents' Well Care Visit Initiative. Thank you so much, Imani. Um, pleasure to be here with all of you today. I'm Jordana Snyder, um, and the objectives of our webinar today are to describe our new set of resources called the Thinking About Good Health um, Tools, uh, which are designed um, as well care visit provider checklists and adolescent pre-visit questionnaires, um, and we'll be able to identify the benefits of those tools as well. You'll be able to identify one strategy to implement the tools, and identify one strategy for approaching difficult conversations with your adolescent teens as well. Just to kick off a little fun on this Thursday afternoon, here's a little brain teaser for you. If you have an STD, sexually transmitted disease or infection, you cannot be a participant in the TV show The Bachelor. True or false? You can answer to yourself. The answer is actually true. If an applicant has any STDs, they cannot participate in The Bachelor. And moving into what you joined us here for today. Um, so we're gonna talk about enhancing the adolescent well care visit. And we're gonna talk about the tools that we created and pilot tested to be able to uh, think about how to enhance that visit. Um, and this project has a long history here at School Based Health Alliance. And um, we, we had support from um, Merck from 2015 through 2017, 
and through 2016 through 2017 and from 2018 through 2019. And the Highmark Foundation also joined us in supporting this project from 2016 to 2017. Uh, you can see that in the first two years of the initiative, there was a literature review and focus group uh, to determine what uh, males, 15 to young adult, kind of needed around uh, the well care visit and what their chief concerns were. Uh, after that was completed, we developed and pre-tested a patient self-assessment and provider checklist uh, for, for males 15 to young adult and a corresponding document for the providers as well. Uh, our, in 2016 and 17, we wanted to build on this work and uh, we actually pilot tested um, tools for younger males aged 9 to 14. Um, and then we also developed a corresponding set of tools for females ages 9 to 14 and 15 to young adult. And in this iteration of the project, which you'll hear about today more from our presenters, uh, we pilot tested uh, the tools for the females as well. So the idea behind the project is that the use of a standardized self-assessment questionnaire and a provider checklist empowers adolescents and providers to actively engage in difficult conversations that in turn will lead to successful well care visit outcomes. Um, and these tools encourage open and honest confidential conversations uh, which are developably appropriate and culturally appropriate as well, um, especially around difficult subjects um, around sexual health. So we want to facilitate conversations around topics that both patients and providers find challenging to discuss due to being too embarrassing or private. Um, and so we believe that if we created tools to um, enhance these conversations, not only would there be a benefit between the conversations between patients and the providers, but between children and parents, providers and patients, providers and parents, and teachers and students, and even students um, with other students and peers who are in romantic relationships and friendships relationships. Um, and the whole idea is really that we should regard the sexual health conversations that we have as natural, normal, and supportive of good general physical and mental health. Um, now the idea for this, for this project came from that we didn't really have a good framework or model for these conversations. Um, we, we really know how to talk about medical things like losing weight, lowering cholesterol, uh, but don't always know how to talk about sexual health. And even when we do, um, oftentimes it just seems uncomfortable. So beyond the how do we make this normal, uh, we realized that people needed actual tools and conversation starters uh, to be able to have effective conversations. Um, so we wanted to provide specific sexual health and HPV vaccine talking points um, with a broader tool around overall wellness that could be used during the well care visit. And the idea, again, behind these tools is that everyone would come into the visit, both patient and provider, having some idea about what the conversation might look like before that, essentially a prompt. So how did we create the tools and what did we end up creating? Well, first we went through, as I mentioned in the project history, we went through um, a series of literature review. So we looked at uh, publications that cover practice and vaccine recommendations for adolescents and young adults. Uh, we looked at surveys around attitudes, knowledge, and behavior um, from adolescents as they interact with the medical system, and then also resources on facilitating better communications between providers and patients. We found a lot of really great material, um, including a lot of um, clinician and patient checklists and pre-visit forms. Uh, we also looked at um, you know, documents from American Academy of Pediatrics and Bright Futures recommendations. Um, so we realized that the framework exists and it was really just more a matter for us to develop a version that worked for teens um, who are being seen in school-based health centers and that also specifically um, mentioned current HPV vaccination guidelines. And after a lot of you know, editing from a variety of partners, School Based Health Alliance, American Sexual Health Association, Healthy Teen Network, um, and board members from the American Sexual Health Association, um, we kind of were able to draft some tools. But 
in the process before we drafted the tools, we really learned that the main issues around adolescent healthcare and adolescents accessing healthcare um, continue to be privacy, confidentiality, and trust. So we wanted to make sure that when we built the tool, we built in reassurances about confidentiality into the patient tool itself, as well as into the provider checklist. Um, and so we encourage the providers to share at the beginning of the visit, this visit is private and confidential, um, and that the same thing went for the patient self-assessment, um, where patients were essentially told, this is a tool for you to utilize, uh, but, um, this is your information, it's not being documented into your medical record, it's just kind of a prompt for you to use. Um, and again, the idea that for adolescents that sexual health doesn't exist in a vacuum and it's not just about contraception and STDs, um, but that there's a relationship component to think about and a psychosocial component to consider as well. Um, and that um, when teens develop a strong relationship with with a trusted um, adult, and that trusted adult can be a medical professional, and um, that they are open to receiving information and health education from them. We created tools for groups ages nine to 14 and 15 to young adult for both males and females. Um, there's obviously a great deal of overlap between um, the content of the tools for both males and females and for both age groups. Um, they both have some areas where there's opportunity to talk about general health um, and sexual health. Um, but for instance, sexual activity and pregnancy are uh, rarer among patients 9 to 14. Um, and sex in this age group is almost always non-consensual sex. So the older kids have more of a need, apologies, there's an ambulance here. So we centered around some, some contraception messaging um, and questions and a little bit more questions about sexual activity um, and safety um, for, the older, for the older tools. Um, there's also a little bit of a difference in, the, in how the vaccine recommendation goes for the HPV vaccine um, in that it's, um, available um, for kids 9 to 14. However, um, for 15 and plus, the language is such that it's recommended. And then we just wanted to make sure that there was also just different imagery so that um, a female who is 11 years old receives um, a tool that has an image that resonates with her of a young female rather than of a 16 or 18 year old male. And the goals of our project, uh, not only in developing the tools, but in um, these cohorts where we were pilot testing the tools as well, we had a lot of intended outcomes. So for the provider, we wanted to make sure that the, the provider felt comfortable, more comfortable by the end of the project, um, engaging in conversations about HPV when performing well care visits, and then also conducting open and honest conversations about reproductive health. For the patient, we wanted them to feel comfortable discussing sensitive topics with the provider. Um, we also wanted them to demonstrate increased knowledge and understanding of HPV, and perhaps even identify um, intent or receipt of HPV vaccination, um, and overall, you know, kind of document a positive experience of care. So that's what we were looking for. And again, we focused on the well care visit because the well care visit is a really wonderful opportunity um, to provide health education in general and to really screen um, patients about their, uh, their risks. School-based health center providers should conduct these visits annually because it's not only a chance to deliver comprehensive and evidence-based preventative care, um, it also allows prevent providers to identify health risks early and then to intervene. Um, and it's also one of our school-based health alliance um, national quality indicators, so the percentage of well care visits that are provided. And with the link to HPV, um, another component of this project was really just to focus on that, first of all, HPV um, can cause cancer and there's a vaccine available to prevent it. Um, and so thinking about the role of a primary care clinician like yourselves, 
being involved in cancer prevention is a really important um, element as well. Um, and this was uh, one of the impetuses for the project and in the focus because the vaccination rates, um, especially wrong, among young males, were young were lower than um, that lower than than the public health field wanted them to be. And just so um, your just to refresh your mind, the current recommendations are that there's a two dose schedule for both girls and boys um, who initiate the vaccine between nine and 14 years of age. And then if you're 15 to 26 years of age, um, and now that actually just got extended and approved for up to 45, um, but I think that that's still um, in process. The vaccine got approved for that, but the recommendations haven't yet caught up. Um, but that there's a three dose series at that point in time. So in the pilots, we really learned a lot about um, the practices, the school-based health center practices around HPV, around consent rates, around um, best practices for um, introducing these topics. And we also looked at provider knowledge and efficacy on implementing the HPV guidelines. Um, I'll just share a little bit of data about that and then we'll get back to the tools themselves. But for the project where we focused on um, the mail, using the mail tools, 99% had no objections to receiving the vaccination, uh, but 24% of their parents actually did voice concern um, or barrier to having their son vaccinated. Um, and in that trial, 54% of the providers actually did administer the vaccine. And then in the female cohort, we found that over 97% of the providers for the female well care visits um, actually discussed HPV with their patients, um, and then also discussed HPV vaccination with their patients. Um, more of the, the providers who saw middle school students, so age 9 to 14, um, had higher rates of speaking with parents than those in high school. And um, about 80% of providers indicated that they spoke with 80% of the visits for middle school students providers indicated that they spoke with a parent about an HPV vaccine, so that's great. Um, and most of the females had no, no barriers to the vaccine themselves, except disliking a shot. Um, so sometimes a barrier for the older students is that they'd already completed the series. So there was no need to you know, talk about how you were gonna get the vaccine and where you were gonna get it. Um, and at the end of the project, we saw a great increase in provider self-efficacy on implementing the current guidelines. And, um, and we found that um, there was an increase in vaccine, HPV vaccine knowledge as well as immunization rates as well. So moving on to just the content of the tools itself. The tools, again, were designed based on our findings from our literature review, as well as our focus group. So um, the first tool that we, we developed is the tool for males, um, for the older males. And in our focus group, we found that adolescent males use the internet as their number one source of health information, uh, that they tend to verify their health information with a parent or a trusted adult. Um, they have a desire to make informed decisions about their own health. And they're willing to engage in open and honest conversations about their health with both of the providers and trusted adults. Um, so the male tools cover substance abuse, safety, sexual health, uh, general health, relationships, um, sexual identity, um, safety in the neighborhood, safety at home, uh, diet, exercise, um, and several other health topics. It's a busy, busy day here in DC. I have another ambulance or fire engine. And we tested these male tools during 180 well care visits. Um, and during these visits, again, the provider used the opportunity looking at the checklist and, and when a patient completed the self-assessment um, prior to the visit uh, to discuss HPV, its risks, and the benefits of the vaccine, vaccines themselves. And then we decided to pilot test the tools for the younger males as well. Um, and again, 
similar topics to uh, those for the older males, just a little bit of a, um, less of an emphasis on um, some questions about sexual, about sexual health and some less, not as many details that were kind of asked about. Also, um, there were questions about, um, the questions about drug use for the 15 to young adult males were more in detail than those for the, the younger males. And then we found really great results with that, which I'll share uh, after our presenters share. And um, we believe that a similar approach with the preteen and adolescent females would also work to increase the vaccine rates in these populations and to improve the nature of the conversations as well. So each tool, males and females, starts with an introduction to familiarize the patients with what will happen during the visit and describes the purpose of the self-assessment um, itself as a tool to have the patients advocate for themselves and their needs and and their own needs. Um, the introduction also reminds the patients to ask questions and clarifying things that they don't understand either in the tool itself or during the visit itself. And the way that the tools are designed is that they have open-ended, a lot of open-ended questions, open-ended questions so that the, the teens could provide more information about their um, about their healthcare questions, really. The female tools ask about habits like exercise, sleep, substance use, um, and it gets again into safety um, and into sexual health and gender identity. Um, so a lot of areas that are, are similar. The tools also talk about, the, the male tools also talk about bullying, anger, sadness, self-harm, etc. And for the older females, um, again, the, the questions around sexual behaviors um, are a little bit more detailed. All of the tools ended with reminding the teens about the importance of vaccination and introduces the HPV vaccination as a shot to prevent cancer. It also prompts the patients to ask the providers more about this. Um, and so when we beta tested both tools, so we tested it with like a small group of people, all of the male tools and all the female tools. And um, with the female tools, they found that the tools were easy to understand. They rated it high for being helpful to prepare for the well care visit, um, that they didn't have any additional suggestions about how to ask sexual health questions or that they didn't feel like any other questions needed to be added to the tool. And patients said that they would use the tool before a well care visit. So in a small way, or this is kind of our, our pre-data for, um, for our larger pilots where we were actually going to test this out. And then again, um, for each set of tools, we, we developed a corresponding provider checklist that includes tips for encouraging an open conversation and building rapport. Again, back to that building a trusting relationship with the teen is really important. Um, questions that mirror the questions on the self-assessment. So prompts for the providers to talk about diet, physical activity, body image, weight, substance use, safety, mental health, STIs, uh, HPV vaccination, sexuality, um, and then also um, other, other standard vaccines that, that are recommended. And now I'll move to introducing our presenters who are going to share, um, who both pilot tested the female tools, and they're gonna share a little bit about their experiences using those tools. So I wanna thank Lisa Howe, who's joining us from the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center um, in Massachusetts. And um, Lisa's been really wonderful in, our, in this learning collaborative, and she's gonna share with you what she's learned. Okay, thank you, Jordana. I'm just going to... Um move forward with my first slide. Thank you again. I'm Lisa Howe. I'm a nurse practitioner here in Greater Lawrence Family Health Center. Um, we are a large federally qualified health center um, north of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, we take care of, there's six primary care sites and we have two school-based health centers and um, we also have a mobile health unit that goes to a, um, 
another school that, that doesn't have a school-based health center uh, located within it. Um, we have a large uh, student population. It's all high school age students. We're trying to get into the middle schools, um, but a little under 5,000 students. And we see about 6,000 visits a year in the two school-based health centers and the mobile health unit. Um, our uh, site, our FQHE is also a family practice residency training program. So we have um, family practice doctors that rotate through the school-based health centers to get their adolescent medicine rotation. Um, so I found this tool really helpful in helping them focus on the questions. Um, our students here are um, cult it's a pretty culturally diverse population, um, primarily Latinos from Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. We joined the project because um, we had been doing an ongoing HPV vaccine completion project. Um, the Dana-Farber Hospital, which is located in Boston with the American Cancer Society, had come to Lawrence to say that our HPV completion, vaccine completions was low, um, and they were trying to get us to improve those numbers. Um, what we ended up finding out was that we weren't our, our EMR was not reporting them into the national database, um, and our HPV vaccine completion rates were actually very high. They were close to 85%. Um, the population here, um, what I find when I bring up the subject of HPV vaccines is a lot of the parents know about it and want the vaccine, and there's really not many um, families here that are against the vaccine. So we do have, we did have the benefit of increasing our vaccine, uh, our HPV vaccine completion rates. Uh, but because we were doing the project and this um, opportunity came, I wanted to see if there was any other way um, to do this. We were also very interested in getting, using a new well child visit tool for adolescents. Um, we do all the usual screens, the PHQ-2, PHQ-9, craft heads, um, wraps, but we were looking for something that was a little bit more comprehensive and more teen friendly and quicker to use. Um, and I had seen this, the, the mail project, and I was very interested in trying that out at our site. Um, and then they offered giving us gift cards for our students. So um, they did give us $10 gift cards to use for 30 students per school. So we had 60 gift cards and the kids love that. So they were happy to come and get their uh, physicals with us and to use the tools and try them out. So that's why we joined the project. The strategies um, for implementing the project was um, we asked the students to fill out the thinking about good health questionnaire. Um, we made sure that they knew it was confidential. We made sure that they knew it was not going to be part of their medical record and that it was voluntary. They didn't need to, they didn't have to fill it out if they didn't want to fill it out. Um, and that they would get a gift card when they completed the, using the tool. We also um, had these gift bags, that, there's a picture there um, to give them, we put the gift card in the bag and it was just general um, hygiene things. Um, some chapstick, kids, kids seem to like it. They can throw it in their gym bag or whatever. Um, so we did use um, those. Um, we found the tool, the provider tool was really helpful when we had residents rotate through um, and they were able to find the questions that they needed to use so they could, they could review the provider tool prior to seeing the students. Um, what I really liked about the tool is it was a really nice, quick way I could go over it and see if there are any concerns that I had and focus my um, HPI on those concerns. Um, what uh, the other takeaway that I had was that since most of my students, because it's high school age, their HPV series was completed, it did give me an incentive to educate them regarding what H the HPV vaccine was for and that it was cancer prevention. 
um, even though they have their series complete. Um, and, and I learned that when after the students had to fill out an after visit survey, and one of the questions was, does HPV cause cancer? And they would say no. <laughs> and so it made me change my dialogue with them so that I could say, you've already received this vaccine, and this vaccine will prevent cervical cancer um, or, or uh, throat cancer or anal cancer. So um, it did change a little bit of the way that I did things. Um, and then my last slide here is what we learned. Um, I, the teens really responded well to open-ended questions and I found that so surprising because I, I would assume that they would just want to do the checklist and leave the open-ended blank but they never did. And the things that they would say, like, what do you do for exercise? Um, I dance in my room for an hour every night. Or, um, you know, it kind of gave me a, a broader picture of the, of the team. Um, and so we like the tool so much that we're now using them for all our well child visits. We've actually developed quick texts for them to be entered into our EMR. Um, and it's, it's been a nice way for us to, to kind of go through the answers um, quickly and get, get it documented in the record without having to scan it. Um, what I found, um, I talked about how they most didn't know that the HPV prevented cancer um, and that it was if, I, if kids needed to get the vaccine, if they hadn't received the vaccine by the time I got them, if we could focus on the cancer prevention piece with the parents, um, that it was easier to get them to agree to the vaccine. And also, um, if we could have them get the vaccine before age 15, because it improves their immunity, and they'd only need a two-dose series. So those were kind of the two motivators to, to get them to do the vaccine. Um, one other piece about giving the vaccine was we have a school-based health center consent form that the parents sign at the beginning of freshmen, we just had freshman orientation for next year's freshmen. Parents sign that consent form because they want their kids to be able to seen, be seen at our site. Um, part of the consent form says that they, um, they give us permission to give all routinely, routine recommended vaccines. And HPV is considered a routine recommended vaccine, even though it's not required. Um, so we could give HPV without parental consent at our school-based health center. I try not to do that, um, but we, we can do that. Um, just a little, another little piece is um, those open-ended questions, and even the questions on the form that, that ask for, you know, do you have any concerns about your genitals or gender identity? Um, teens that were really well known to us disclose things that they hadn't, we hadn't previously discussed, and I found the tool to be really good at drilling down. Um, and one, just one girl that I'd known for the last three years, um, one of her concerns in the first blocks was that she, um, she was concerned about her genitals. And we'd never, she'd never said she was concerned about it before, and then we were able to have a discussion about it. and. Um, you know, kind of make her feel comfortable that there's that she was normal. She was within normal limit. Um, so the tools we we love them. The residents really loved using them. The kids seem to really enjoy using them, um, and we will continue. That is all for me. I think Nicole is next. Thank you. Thank you so much. You just had to unmute. Thanks so much, Lisa. That was really wonderful. I especially love, I, I love those little hygiene kits that you give to your students. Yeah, they love them. Yeah, that's really cute. And I really love the, the development of the quick text for the EMR and that you utilize this as a training opportunity for your residents. It really seems like um, you found a ways to utilize the tool and, um, and really to, to use it to its full, full benefit. Um, so I think that that's really helpful to, to other, uh, other providers. And I think like, again, how you shared that story about um, that, that patient hadn't previously disclosed that she had concerns about her genitals and that this tool allowed her to be able to do that. And that 
your response as a provider is really excellent in that you said, this is normal. Right. That, you know, especially for teens, it's so important for them to feel like, for everyone, but for teens, especially when they're really thinking about what they're like compared to their peers to normalize that. It's really, that's really a great application. So thank you so much for sharing that story. And some of the other tools we use don't give space to ask those types of questions. Right. So I really like that. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and of course, some, some students respond better verbally and some students respond better in, um, in, in a written fashion. So this provided both opportunities. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, and next we have Nicole, I'm trying to advance the slide. Which is staying still for right now. Sorry about that. Okay, so, and it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Nicole Ray, who is the Assistant Medical Director of School Ways Health at the Blue Ridge Health System um, in North Carolina. And Nicole has also been an all-star on our Enhancing Adolescent, Female Adolescent Well Care Visit um, Initiative. And um, she's utilized the tools in a really uh, great way as well. So uh, where Lisa was talking about um, utilizing the tools in a high school space, Nicole is predominantly using them in a uh, middle school space. And the other thing I, I just wanted to say about um, uh, Lisa's site is that um, her population is mostly Hispanic, and Hispanic from the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. And um, that also created a, um, a need for us to create uh, companion tools in Spanish. And actually Nicole and her team um, were able to create translations of those tools as well. So. I'm going to turn it over you, to you, Nicole. And Thank you, Diana. Yep. All right. So um, I've been with Blue Ridge Health for about five years um, and doing primarily school-based health for the past three years. Um, Blue Ridge is a large FQHC uh, in North Carolina um, and was actually founded as a, um, a migrant farm worker kind of center. And so we also see a large Hispanic population um, in the area at Blue Ridge, so we have we have a great team in place, as, as Jordana mentioned, to create those um, tools um, to be able to use for both our, our English speaking and Spanish speaking patients. Um, so I just uh, posted a little bit about Blue Ridge and our mission to provide comprehensive quality health care um, to all, and um, my heart is especially with the pediatric population. Um, very similar to Lisa, um, we actually have uh, several primary care sites across the region in several different counties. Um, and we also have um, multiple school-based health centers. Uh, we currently have uh, four health centers in Henderson County, and then we've recently opened up in other counties as well. So um, we're really seeing a large need in this area to increase our school-based health opportunities. A lot of local area schools are kind of catching on that this is a really good thing. We have a lot of students that might not receive care otherwise. And so what, what better place to provide that primary care component than at the school where the students spending a good amount of their day. Um, so like I said, right now we're providing medical services at seven school clinic sites. Uh, right now I work in four of those. Um, and so we did most of our trial, we did all of our trial at our Apple Valley Middle School site. And I'm only there on Fridays. I did them all myself, but I think it's gonna be a great tool to use across the board. Um, one of the great things about Blue Ridge is we also have behavioral health integrated um, at least a few days a week, if not every day, at almost all of our sites. And so when using the tool, if we came up with something, um, you know, as we're digging a little deeper, as Lisa said, that maybe there is some anxiety, some depression, some discrimination going on, um, I can do a warm handoff right then to one of our behavioral health providers um, and get that student involved in care. Um, and of course, we do provide some nutrition, dental, 
um, and other services available at the school as well. Um, we're also planning on expanding um, and doing some telehealth medical services next year, which is really exciting. Um, so here's where we're located. Like I said, we completed this project at Apple Valley Middle School. So I primarily use that nine to 14 year old tool, which um, probably had some interesting dynamics compared to maybe how I would have phrased some things at the high school. Um, and then the rest of the time I spend in Bruce Drysdale and Sugarloaf Elementary Schools. Um, and I could see definitely um, some value in maybe starting to use those tools in my older elementary school students as well. Um, so here's just some of our 2017 statistics. I couldn't get some of our 2018 statistics yet, but um, we're definitely making an impact at our Henderson County Schools um, and are excited to expand to some of the others. Um, you know, notice that uh, probably half our students are, are Medicaid services, and so their parents are not, you know, receiving a bill when they come to the health center, but we're still, um, you know, regularly seeing them and providing the care that they need with some of our patients that might not otherwise get care. Um, and maybe a quarter of our students are considered self-pay or sliding scale. Um, at our school-based health sites, we have a different sliding scale where if the patient needs services and they are slide A or at that highest need, uh, we see them for free. Um, so why we joined the project, we are actually just starting to work with the American Cancer Society with the HPV project, probably similar to what Lisa is doing. And so that's a whole nother thing we have going on. Um, so our, our practice is very interested in increasing um, HPV rates right now as well. Um, North Carolina does not require HPV vaccination for schools. So I think a lot of parents see it as an optional vaccine and they just kind of don't think it's a big deal. So we, we don't have great vaccination rates. Um, you know, another thing is we, we all kind of have this awkward moment sometimes during our well child exams where I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm, I'm interrogating my patients and clicking buttons over a computer screen. Um, you know, sometimes you have the, the patients who are over verbal and you can't quite get them to focus. And then you have your other patients who kind of shrug their shoulders to everything that you ask. Um, so having kind of a standardized tool to really facilitate that interaction, um, both to make sure that we're covering topics that need to be covered, but also, you know, creating a space for um, a little bit easier of a conversation around topics that um, maybe aren't so easy to talk about, both for the provider um, as well as the patient. Um, in, in utilizing this, you know, I sat down with my practice manager and said, you know, let's can we do 30 well child checks? Can I do 30 well child checks in the space of time? And so really focusing on getting some of these students in for the well child check where uh, we may not have focused on that previously, um, it's become an impetus to, for us to take a look at next year when the students are coming in and, and really increasing our focus on the well exam and increasing our well visits, um, both from a sustainable practice kind of model, but also because this is a, a crucial time period where many teens um, don't seek care unless it's an acute visit, a sports physical, um, something of that nature. And so, so you see generally a drop off in the well exams when they don't need a vaccine or, or the vaccine isn't required for school. Um, so how we implemented right now, every student that comes down for a medical visit um, is given a RAPS tool. That's the, the rapid uh, assessment adolescent um, a tool developed by the University of Michigan. Um, we implemented that last year. Um, we use that for our UDS measures because we've added the PHQ2 to it to help screen for depression. Um, and I found that it's, it's helped us identify some of those at-risk patients and increase our behavioral health referrals. Um, we try to check on that at least once a semester, um, but every time the student comes down for a visit, our EHR will flag us to say whether or not they're due for that RAP screening. Um, for this study, we decided to use the um, thinking about good health tool for our well visits, still using the RAPS tool for our acute care visits. Um, a lot of the questions overlap with the RAPS, um, but again, the RAPS has this kind of yes, no checklist, which is easy to um, glance at as a provider during an acute care visit, but during that well visit, we wanted to go a little bit deeper. Um, we had been using the Bright Futures tools, which are embedded in our EHR. Um, but again, sometimes you feel like it's more of an interrogation and you may, you may or may not get them to open up as you're kind of clicking those boxes for our Bright Future tools. So I was really interested in how the 
open-ended questions would work. Um, the way we used it is um, when the student was called down for their well child exam, you know, we had identified that ahead of time. Um, they were given the self-assessment tool on a paper copy on a clipboard um, and kind of sat in our lobby waiting area completing that. And then when I was ready for their visit, we would call them back to the exam room. Um, and I was really able to kind of come alongside them and say, well, let's talk about your answer to this question. And so it became more of a conversation rather than an interrogation. Um, I did have the provider checklist tool, which I would kind of review before the visit. Um, and, and I find that, you know, as I did more and more of these exams and use the tool more often that I had to look at the provider checklist tool less often and really come alongside and review that self-assessment tool. Um, I think it would be really helpful for our student learners. Um, Blue Ridge is also a, a teaching facility with residency training programs. We also have PA students and NP students. Um, and so I think it would, be, it would be great to help formulate the way that you ask your questions and do it in a, in a, a manner, in a flow that, that helps the provider be more comfortable as well as the patient being more comfortable. Um, the other thing that I found with the self-assessment tool being completed prior to my visit is that the students were prepared to talk about things um, as opposed to waiting until we're in the exam room and then starting to ask them about um, sexual activity and substance abuse. Some of them seem a little cough off guard and maybe even a little defensive. Um, whereas with the tool ahead of time, they were more prepared for those questions and to have a conversation about those questions. Um, after my visit, um, you know, we, we would have them complete the post-visit survey to see how they felt about that thinking about good health tool. Um, one of the interesting things I found is that some of them said they didn't use it, even though they did. So I had made sure that I informed them that they were doing the thinking about good health tool. Um, and I, I really um, changed the way that I discussed it, like Lisa said, as far as 100% um, of my patients after they left me said that they learned that HPV could cause cancer, whereas at the beginning of the visit, they found that um, most of them maybe had some vague idea of HPV as a virus, but they didn't really know what it was or um, why we were vaccinating against it. Um, and then the super exciting thing is that um, I went out and got gift cards, the $10 gift cards to Starbucks, Chick-fil-A, and Walmart, and my students got to pick which one they wanted, and they were all like, they looked like they went on the prices right when they left me. So they were really excited about their, their well child checks. Um, so what we learned um, as being part of this project, uh, like Jordana said, is that a Spanish version of the tool was necessary. Um, so Kenneth, our language lead specialist, worked with his team and developed that for us. Um, that, like I said, our students felt more comfortable and prepared for discussing those topics. Um, I actually had a student come down that, that I'm more familiar with. Um, I found out that she's recently come to identify herself as bisexual and she was actually feeling a little discriminated against by some of her peers as she came out with that. Um, and so we were able to have a really great discussion about um, friends and sexual orientation and um, she ended up talking with one of the counselors for a little bit and she knows that now those behavioral health services are there as needed um, and really the zero tolerance on bullying and discrimination that exists in the school um, she's found support in our clinic um, I found that the open-ended questions were more helpful even as simple as you know are you getting a good amount of sleep you know that's a yes or no question but with the open-ended question they'd say well how much sleep do you get and they write in five hours I'm like wow that is so not a good amount of sleep um, and I was able to talk to some of my teens about, you know, sometimes you need more sleep than a toddler and you're learning and there's social pressures and things like that. Um, so everything from not just the sexual activity and substance abuse, but also, you know, their sleep habits, whether or not they need to lose weight. And um, I think Lisa mentioned this as well, if they're exercising, well, how are you exercising? I go for a run every day. Oh, well, do you like running? No, not really. So you can help really implement them, um, do some motivational interviewing to help implement change that's going to be more meaningful um, for those students and help maybe avoid some risky behaviors in the future. Thank you so much, Nicole. That's amazing. Oh, was that it? Oh, okay. Oh, well, let's see. <laughs> no, no, I was good. I was like, oh, I thought I had another slide. I'm good. Well, actually, let's see. Uh, well, thank you so much. First of all, you did. You did 30 well care visits. <laughs> 
I did. Um, I did all I of them. The slide, actually. So oh, there we go. Um, so just some things that I noticed, um, like I said, for our UDS screening measures and also just for a good, um, make sure we're doing a comprehensive visit. I would add the PHQ2. Um, uh, you know, if we printed out a paper copy, we might just cut and paste it onto there um, to make sure that we are checking the boxes that we need to. Um, and, you know, even though it, the tool helped facilitate discussion about depression, um, you know, kind of leading into some of those other evidence-based tools like the PHQA would be helpful. Um, I found that consistently across my middle school population, um, you know, one of the, the questions is phrased, do you go out with boys or girls? And I think that's phrased a little bit differently than the high school form, um, but a lot of them clicked yes. And so I would start to have a talk about um, sexual orientation, but they just meant like going out, like hanging out, like going to the movies, not like who they're attracted to. Um, and so kind of uh, reemphasizing that as far as um, who do you find yourself attracted to? Attracted to. Um, for our own personal use, um, we have been looking at remodeling this clinic for a little while, um, and we, we don't have a great private space for our students to complete some of these assessments. So even though we say this is confidential between us, you know, if their friend's sitting next to them, you know, looking over their shoulder, that may or may not be helpful for that student to answer truthfully. Um, and if they had any concerns, things like that. Um, right now we are planning on continuing to use the well adolescent visit tool for our, our well child checks. And I hope that we can get that um, uh, starting to be used throughout the organization. Like I said, we have residents at our, some of our other sites and main clinics. Um, but I really do like the, the RAPS tool for those acute care visits um, for that rapid assessment, like it said. But um, the, the tool really does allow an efficient um, but deeper way to address some of those topics with your patients. There I am. Thank you so much, Nicole. Sorry about cutting off there short. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think you're, um, I, I loved how you used the tools and, and also talked about um, this is a real focus on increasing the number of well care visits rather than just kind of uh, the acute visits themselves and as a real opportunity to, um, to focus on prevention um, for this critical age group. I really like that, so that's wonderful. And um, so I'm just going to share some, some data about, um, we heard from two of these wonderful sites that pilot tested these female tools um, in the last six months or so. And in the year prior, we also tested um, the tools uh, for the 9 to 14 year old males. So we pilot tested with 180 males and a total of 333 females from both age groups and 133 from ages 9 to 14 and 200 from the 15 plus age um, across 11 school based health center sites. Um, and again, the goal of this tool was primarily to use it during the well care visit as we talked about, um, but some of the providers also indicated that they chose to use it during um, reproductive visits or sports physicals. So our first question was, you know, after each visit, after each visit, we asked patients and providers to fill out a short survey, like Nicole talked about, and uh, to share, you know, if they used the tool and how they used it and what happened in the visit itself. And good to know that uh, after this focused intervention, almost all the patients used the assessment tools during the intervention period. Um, we saw higher rates of use by the females than the males, um, but it, that could represent what you were saying, Nicole, about uh, People didn't know that they were called, but thinking about good health tools potentially. Um, but we had a total of 479 um, patients, both male and female, across across uh, the age groups that have tested these tools in the last uh, two years, which is really amazing. And you can see the breakdown of uh, the number of females, 9 to 14, who used it were seven, were 93 percent of those who um, were given the survey. And then for those 15 to young adult, uh, it was 92%. So really high rates of using the survey, of using the, the tools, sorry, the patient assessment tools. 
again, those are the tools that the patients get either sitting in the waiting room or as homework before the visit to prompt them. Here's what's going to happen during the visit. Here are my primary healthcare concerns and my questions. And, and then whether it was in paper form and tablet form, they could use that opportunity to fill out their own concerns. So then, you know, we also wanted to know, uh, which Nicole and Lisa both talked about, is did patients understand that there's a link between HPV, human papilloma virus, and cancer itself, and that this, the well care visit is not only an opportunity to talk about um, uh, pre prevention for, um, for, for general health things, but also for sexual health and um, and specifically that there's a vaccine available as well that can um, inhibit that, that um, cause and effect, essentially. Um, and so 91% of the males that uh, took the survey uh, with an N of 223 learned about HPV. And then um, for the females, um, 92.5% indicated that they know that HPV causes cancer, and 86%, oh, sorry, 94% of females age 15 to young adult know that HPV causes cancer. Another thing that we asked the young females about is um, after the survey, uh, after the visit, they, they were asked, do you know that you can get the HPV vaccine at your school-based health center? And those were also high rates. So good job on um, talking to your patients about what's available at school-based health centers. Um, so again, both uh, at both the middle school and high school levels, for both genders, the patients used the assessment and learned about HPV, as well as the possibility of getting the vaccine at the school-based health center. We also wanted to know if patients felt comfortable talking to their provider, and we also see really high rates of patients indicating that they felt comfortable talking to their provider. This is pretty amazing because this is really what we were trying to, to go for, uh, because, you know, and whenever you have a, um, an adult talking to a teen, there could be a, um, a potential you know, kind of a power imbalance or teens could feel uncomfortable sharing with an adult if they don't feel like it's a trusted adult. Um, and so for, for patients, for 85% of our male patients, 93% of our younger female patients, and 98% of our older female patients, to indicate that they felt comfortable talking to a provider after the visit in a survey that was, that the provider, you know, kind of didn't see that they turned in before that um, was really cool. It wasn't the provider saying, did you feel comfortable talking to me? But regardless, they were able to answer privately and, um, and indicated that the, this tool probably is very helpful. You know, we don't have any indicator about um, comparable visits that, for folks who didn't use the tools, um, but that patients did feel comfortable talking to the provider. And the things that are really cool about that are actually in the nature and the content of those conversations themselves. So did the tools in fact influence those conversations? So we asked the patients and the providers both to list what topics that they've covered during each visit. Uh, and here's what the, the data that the patients shared with us. So the bold indicates the topics that were most frequently discussed. Uh, so you can see for the middle school students, first of all, there's a really um, equal distribution of um, topics that were covered across across the visit. Um, each each patient could indicate multiple topics. So you see, they talked about STIs, sexual intercourse, alcohol use, drug use, anxiety, and depression at a very high level um, across the middle school visits. And the and the older females focus a little bit more on STIs, sexual intercourse, and depression. And we also wanted to see, did the providers use the checklist before the well care visit? So we wanted to make sure that not only were the patients using the tool, but the provider was using it as well. And we see that um, for 87% of our, um, in 87% of the visits, the, the male visits, the providers use the tools. In 93% of the younger female visits, the providers use the tools. And in 99% of the high school visits, the females use the tools. So, wonderful job. We also saw a change from baseline to endpoint. Um, 
you can see from the top to the bottom of uh, providers feeling comfortable with facilitating discussions around sensitive topics. So they were already comfortable to begin with. You saw five, um, five were comfortable and eight were very comfortable and one was uncomfortable, but you did see a slight movement from um, before to after to more um, being very comfortable. And just to summarize, uh, the tools, the we asked the providers to reflect generally, you know, how did it go? And the provider said the tools were easy to use, the patients understood the tools, the tools were helpful in preparing the patients for visits. They provided more health education, which both Lisa and Nicole touched on today. Um, sites indicated that they would continue to use the tools and that they recommend the tools for future school-based health centers. Um, so all in all, we reached our, our intended outcomes were really great and um, we want to post the tools for you to utilize in the field um, during your well care visits. So the tools will be posted along with this archived webinar um, and you'll also get this in your follow-up email. So thank you again so much to each of our presenters. And um, we now do, it's the end of our time, but if you do have any questions, please, please feel free to write them in the Q&A. Yes, please feel free to answer your questions now. Um, of course, if we aren't able to get to the questions, then we will definitely follow up with our presenters and get back to you as soon as possible. So right now, you do have the opportunity to answer your questions. Um, and while you answer them, we do have a few, um, a couple announcements for you. Please join us and become a member. Our members extend and support our work. Trainings like this webinar would not be possible without the support of our members. Registration is now open for our 2019 National School-Based Healthcare Convention. This will take place June 23rd through the 26th in the Washington, D.C. area. So register now and our members receive a special rate. We will have awesome pre-conferences and workshops, advocacy day and rally, hill visits and more. Please visit our website for more information and join us. The last day to register is June 7th. Thank you, Oklahoma. Um, once again, you have time to answer your questions if you have any questions. Um, if you're not, we do have a few questions for you. Um, on your screen will pop up some evaluation pro, um, questions. We will love your feedback. Um, once again, this information is very helpful for us so we can also have more webinars in the future that will meet your needs. Um, so if you can just take time, answer your questions, um, and respond to our questions, we'll leave this open for another minute. We don't want to hold you too much longer. And once again, um, also feel free to email us. We will send a follow-up email that would include information um, or contact information for Jordana. So if you want to reach out directly, you can also send her your question and she will definitely get back to you. Um, and once again, we appreciate everyone and we thank you so much for joining our webinar today. And we'll leave this open for um, about 30 more seconds. Just thank you again to Nicole and to Lisa for, for participating in this project, as well as the other providers who participated in this project and um, for sharing their stories and their lessons with us today. It was my pleasure.